This is going to be very simple. Ladies and gentlemen, Eros is central to Plato in a way that it is not for any other philosopher. Eros is missing from Aristotle's treatise on the soul, but it crops up in Metaphysics Lambda, where he attempts to explain the relation nature has to mind thinking itself. In order to indicate the range and intricacy of the problem of Eros and Plato, I wish to begin with four apparently random observations. In the course of the more systematic account, it should become clear to you how these observations are interconnected. But at the head of everything, let me give a working definition of Eros to which we can appeal from time to time as the occasion warrants. Eros combines the desire to behold at a distance with the desire to join into one. The lover's awareness that the beloved is already complete is coupled with his awareness of his own radical incompleteness, which forces him in turn to realize simultaneously that he could be completed if and only if the beloved against the lover's own conviction were also incomplete and could be completed per impossibile by the lover. With Plato for the first time, man becomes a metaphysical problem and love a metaphysical passion. The ontology of the Republic and the cosmology of the Timaeus give expression to the metaphysical problem of man and the Phaedrus and Symposium reveal the metaphysics of this passion. The Republic and Timaeus get to ontology through the political problem for man, and the Phaedrus and Symposium go through the passion to ontology. In this sense, the two movements are of the same order, but it seems that the political occasions the ascent to the metaphysical through construction whether it be of the best city in speech or of the universe as a likely story. But love gives rise to metaphysics directly without the intervention of the mythical or imaginary. The lover speaks spontaneously of truth and eternity. Love see thus seems more natural than politics. It is far less easy to see how the political or any of its experiences can become metaphysical which we see happening so abruptly in the Republic, then how what starts out as a simply human experience undergoes by itself a transformation into something that seems to bear the impress of what is more than human. That the Phaedrus, however, connects the issue of writing, a making, with Eros, shows that the artificial belongs as much to the understanding of Eros as to the understanding of right. Perhaps it would be better to say that Plato has two themes, justice and love, both in their relation to one another and in their relation to mind. Psychology lurks behind the apparent split between eros and right. The soul of man is the problem. In making the soul of man the problem, Plato dethrones eros as a cosmological force as it appears in either the poets, Hesiod, or the pre-Socratic philosophers, Empedocles and Parmenides. In canceling Eros as the universal principle of attraction, he elevates it ontologically. Plato distinguishes between the way from the principles and the way to the principles. The first way is hypothetical and deductive and suitable for teaching. The second goes from the that of things to the why of things. It is the only way of discovery and philosophy. The Platonic dialogues are a peculiar combination of these two ways, the way of instruction and the way of division and collection, or dialectics for short. Now, if one starts not from the principles, but proceeds to the principles, the start for us is to be found in the simply human things, everything which concerns us and with which we deal. 
It is what Aristotle calls the things first for us, ta pragmata, the business at hand, rather than ta onta, the things that are. In the Lysis, Socrates comes into his own as soon as he abandons cosmological speculation about the prevalence of friendship and enmity throughout nature and turns instead to the neutrality of being and his primary example of a being that is neither good nor bad is man. The titles of 24 of Plato's dialogues contain the names of Socrates' contemporaries. Plato has two themes, political philosophy and philosophy simply. Of the 35 dialogues that have come down to us as Plato's, Socrates narrates only four of them from start to finish. The Republic, the Charmides, the Lysis, and the Erastai. Plato represents Socrates as particularly eager in just these four cases to review for another audience what he had discussed one or two days before. The occasion that prompted each discussion must have been just as important to Socrates as what he discussed. They represent, through self-narration, Socrates' awareness of what he has now come to understand and of what he has not yet understood, as well as how he came to understand what he did and how he failed to understand what he did not. In form, at least, they show Socrates' self-knowledge. The Republic is many times larger and grander than the other three combined. Its theme is justice, which seems more urgent, controversial, and important than the themes of the other three. Eros, on the other hand, sets the stage for the different themes of the three others, whether it be the singular beauty of Charmides, the bashful and baffled lover Hippotheles in the Lysis, or the rivalry between an egghead and a muscle man in the Erastai. They seem to be concerned with what is most intimately Socrates' own and least applicable to anyone else. As soon as Socrates returns to Athens after being on campaign at Potidaea, which heralded the start of the Peloponnesian War, he asks about the state of affairs there. And he does not mean whether the peace party or the war party have the upper hand, but how did philosophy fare in his absence, and who are the new crop of beauties? Socrates confesses to a sexual arousal in the Charmides, and he says in the Lysis that just as different people desire different things, so he since childhood has been erotically disposed, disposed toward the acquisition of friends. Despite this difference between the Republic and the other three dialogues, all of them do have one thing in common. In the entire Platonic corpus, the verb to blush, eruthrian, occurs only when Socrates is the narrator. The blush is the involuntary showing of what one wants to remain hidden. It reveals a defect that one may or may not acknowledge to be a defect. It is clearly related to the issue of eros and self-knowledge. These four dialogues are the invisible blush of Socrates. Two of these dialogues bring us closer to the heart of the problem, the Charmides and Erastai. The comedy starts from the question of sophrosune, or moderation, and then through the intervention of a future tyrant, shifts into the problematical identification of sophrosune with the science of science. Socrates proves that whoever has this science of science must be wholly ignorant of every other science. In the Erastai, on the other hand, Socrates questions the competence of the philosopher, or himself, who, in comparison with any specialist, is the jack of all trades and master of none. The two dialogues together raise the issue of the whole and its parts, and whether the guidance to the understanding of any part 
must come from the problem of the whole. The Rastai opens with Socrates coming across two boys who are disputing some cosmological thesis by means of drawings and gestures. The meaning of its title, Lovers, along with its alternate title, Antarastai, or Rival Lovers, suggests to us that the problem of the whole may have a connection with the human whole, the longing for which seems to be Eros, and that that connection may lie in the equally problematical character of Eros, which only ceases to be so when it is recognized to be philosophy. Now we come to the last observation we have done. Whatever question Plato raises, whether it be what is justice or what is eros, what is death or what is courage, what is moderation or what is piety, the answer always seems to be the same, philosophy. No matter how remote from philosophy a question may appear to be, for example, what is the love of gain or what is law, the argument always turns around and points to philosophy. To philosophize, Socrates says in the Phaedo, is to practice dying and being dead. Who can say what Plato could not have spun out of the whisper? The novel, after all, is just the platonic dialogue without Socrates. And Apuleius wrote the first one about nosiness, or curiositas. No human experience, Plato would seem to claim, does not reveal at its core the quest for knowledge of the whole. Philosophy comprehends the apparent manifold of things and the single truth of their meaning. More precisely, the one thing needful for man is latent in everything men say, do, and experience. There is a coincidence in philosophy, and only in philosophy, of the understanding of all human things with the human good. Now, the masters of human experience, long before they were philosophers, were the poets, who were called simply the wise. They are the competitors to the audacious imperialism of Plato, who threatens to take over each and every well-defined domain, and in reconstituting it as a question, uncover philosophy within it. The two speakers in the symposium who precede Socrates and form a group with him are the comic poet Aristophanes and the tragic poet Agathon. Socrates' speech is not the union of their two speeches, but a third that shows up the partial understanding of both poets and thereby of tragedy and comedy if taken separately. The tragedy and comedy of life, which we take to be the comprehensive understanding of human life, is the phantom image of its true understanding, philosophy, which is neither tragic nor comic, but can be mistaken for one or the other. That Socrates laughs only in the Phaedo warns us against this mistake. The two gods who owe more to poetry than to cult are Hades and Eros. Poetry's discover or invention of these gods thus turns out to be a challenge to Plato. He has to show that Eros does not exist and Hades is nothing but a name for the city. The cave of the Republic reveals Hades for what it is the daimonion of the symposium cuts the god Eros down to size. Plato does not always put all his cards on the table. The missing cards show up with a negative label that safely disposes of them and thus does not allow any access to their possible connection, no matter how subterranean, with that from which they have been officially excluded. For Plato, however, Negation is always the other of the other. Philosophy, therefore, tends to become conspicuous at the boundaries of things, where it binds together what seems to be apart and separates what seems to be together. Now, the private cannot be exposed and go public and still remain what it is. 
Love in particular, we say, is private and non-political. Lovers turn toward each other and away from everyone else. There is a veil over them even in broad daylight. The political can thus get constituted without the intrusion of eros. Plato offers two striking confirmations of this. The Republic discusses the good political order along with the good order of the soul. The virtue that controls desire is moderation and strictly subordinate to the virtue of justice, whose natural basis is in the spirited part of the soul. And this part, if it is not corrupt, has a natural ally in reason, which desire never has. Since the overturning of the political order as such is to be found in tyranny, it is inevitable that the tyrant come forward as eros incarnate. I mentioned, by the way, that the first one to erect an altar to Eros in Attica was an intimate of the Pisistratids. He was Polymark, and he placed it in the groves of the academy. So going back to the Republic, what began as either pre-political or unpolitical roars back as the enemy of the political. The city, in the meantime, was totally communized and privacy institutionally banned. Likewise, in the Timaeus, which is bound closely to the Republic, Eros does not belong to the original constitution of man, but the gods devise it in the second generation after men have become unmanly and unjust. Of course, with this late Plato's last word, it would be impossible for political philosophy and philosophy to cohere. Socrates restricts what he knows to the erotic things. This restriction may explain Socrates' self-confessed incapacity to set his own best city in motion and why he must rely on philosophers who are equally statesmen to do it for him. In the laws, the Athenian stranger breaks radically with his legislative program in the 10th book. There he introduces a theology which demonstrates that there are gods and they are just. The central teaching of this theology is the priority of soul. The soul is defined as self-motion. Socrates, too, had offered the same definition in the Phaedrus. But he had linked it, albeit somewhat mysteriously, with Eros. Now the Athenian stranger assigns the same priority to certain characteristics of soul as he attributes to the soul itself. He, refer he first restricts those characteristics to opinion, care, mind, art, and law. And we are led to suppose, by the company it is in, that by opinion he means true opinion. But later he grants the same priority no less to false opinion than to true. And he then expands the list to include joy and pain, confidence and fear, hatred and affection. But he never adds to soul either eros or desire, epithumia. Socrates' myth of the Phaedrus has been legalized and stripped of its wings. In the laws, there is nothing beyond the visible heaven. This is as it should be. Socrates says that the fundamental experience of the lover involves his utter contempt for all the lawful and decent things in which he once took pride. At the beginning of the laws, the Athenian stranger criticizes Dorian practices for their exclusive concern with resistance to pain without providing for any defense against the insidiousness of pleasure. He traces to the common mess in which all males participate the prevalence of pederasty in Crete and the looseness of women in Sparta. He therefore proposes a reorientation of the law away from courage and toward moderation. But when he has finished with his re-education, and set up the institutions to support it, he admits in Book 8 
that he has not come any closer than the Dorians to confining Eros within the law. Indeed, he admits he has exacerbated the problem by making all the young idle. I remark, by the way, that the first one to formulate the opposition between law and eros was Herodotus. He restricts the verbs erasthai and eran to desires that transgress the law, whether they be the desire for tyranny or for what is sexually forbidden by law. His inquiries opens with Candoli's eros provoking him to demand that Gyges sees his wife naked. And the inquiries closes with Xerxes Eros for his brother's wife. And the second half of the first book of Herodotus begins with Deus's Eros for tyranny. So that, I think, is the background to this. Now, the conflict between Eros and law would seem to point to the opposition between philosophy and the city. That opposition would dissolve, apparently, in the rule of a philosopher king. But that solution concedes not only that the opposition persists as long as the philosopher does not rule, but that philosophy itself never rules. When the philosopher rules, he does not philosophize. He descends into the cave and does not free any of the prisoners from their chains. Were they to get their hands on him, they would kill him. In the Republic, Socrates says the first experience of philosophy induces the contravention of the law, and he compares it to the awakening of the suspicion that one is not the legitimate offspring of one's parents. Everything one thought to be noble, just, and good now appears to be merely established by law, with no more grounds for its truth than the assurance the parents of Oedipus could give him that he was theirs. It is not accidental that Oedipus's philosophical doubt, despite their assurance, should result in Sophocles' play being called Oedipus the Tyrant. Oedipus, through the crime of patricide, which he commits before he solves the riddle of the Sphinx, and the crime of incest, which he commits afterwards, enacts philosophy's desacralization of everything in the element of self-ignorance. That self-ignorance shows up in Oedipus's ignorance, not only of his own origin, but of the meaning of his solution to the riddle of the Sphinx. Oedipus did not solve the riddle, but uncovered the true riddle, man, for he never reflected on why he alone should have been able to solve it. Plato's effort consists in stripping tragedy from Oedipus and equipping him with self-knowledge. Just as the city Socrates devises in the Republic necessarily allows for incest, so Plato's Iliadic stranger must beg Theotetus' pardon if he is to go on to kill his father, Parmenides. Before I turn to the Phaedrus and Symposium as containing the twinned accounts of Eros, a word should be said about the two dialogues that form an equally natural pair with each other, as well as with the Phaedrus and Symposium. Inasmuch as the Phaedrus is about philosophical rhetoric, its counterpart is the Gorgias, whose general theme is political rhetoric, but whose particular focus is on punitive rhetoric. As for the Protagoras, all the main characters in the symposium, with the ex exception of Aristophanes, showed up in it when they were much younger. Socrates likens his entrance into the setting of the Protagoras to Odysseus's descent into Hades. His Protagoras differs from all other Platonic dialogues in consistently adding piety as a fifth virtue to the classical four of wisdom, justice, 
moderation and courage. Now there would be a natural basis for piety if it could be shown that the experience of Eros points to the divinity of Eros. Socrates sets out to demolish that possibility in the symposium and in the Phaedrus to account for the belief in the god Eros. The Gorgias and Protagoras thus look like the political reflections of the two philosophical dialogues on Eros and emphasize, especially if one considers the extreme putativeness of Protagoras's myth, how much the city has to do with punishment and how absent such a consideration is from philosophy. Those two political dialogues correspond in the schema Socrates outlines in the Gorgias to rhetoric and sophistry, respectively. And rhetoric and sophistry are there said to be phantom images of the true political art, the corrective part of which is justice, and whose educative part is the art of legislation. Sophistry and rhetoric, however, are not in their mimicry as distinct as the originals, and their practitioners are mixed up together. The Gorgias and Protagoras thus stand opposed to the Republic and laws on the one side, and on the other side to the Phaedrus and Symposium. We can say, therefore, that rhetoric represents a confusion or mixture of what the Republic and Phaedrus clearly distinguish, and sophistry, in turn, represents an equal confusion of what the laws and symposium separate. Rhetoric confuses the just with the beautiful. Sophistry confuses the beautiful with the good. Agathon, who more than anyone else in the symposium insists on the beauty of Eros, indulges at the end of his speech in Gorgianic jingles. Socrates says, his sole knowledge is of Eros. He has an erotic art. The phrase itself smacks of self-contradiction, or at least of paradox. If it is an art, it is as specialized as any other art with its own principles and domain. As an art, it would either contemplate or make the things of its domain. If it contemplates erotic things as logistics does numbers, it knows what kinds of erotic things there are, how many there are, and how they stand in relation to one another. If it makes erotic things, it knows out of what kinds of things they can be made, but always waits on its customers for whatever product they want. In so far, as Socrates' erotic art is contemplative, it seems to be presented in the symposium. And insofar as it is a kind of making, the Phaedrus would give it its general formulation, and the Lysis would exemplify it. There, in the, so in the Lysis, Socrates, as if he were a snake oil salesman, demonstrates for free, in the presence of a lover, how he can ensnare his beloved. The erotic art would thus be a kind of rhetoric on the one hand and a kind of speculative method on the other. It would be a physics of illusions and resemble nothing so much as Aristophanes' mockery of Socrates. He has Claudices at his beck and call and they can appear in any shape they want while being composed themselves of the elementary nature of things. However plausible it may appear to be to identify the speculative rhetoric with Socrates' erotic art, it cannot be right, because eros is clearly identified with philosophy. What could the art of philosophy mean? It cannot mean that philosophy is either a poetic art and only knows what it makes, or a deductive science without in either case ceasing to be philosophy. The art of philosophy can only mean the art of dialegistai. 
Dialegasthai divides between its ordinary sense to converse and its precise sense, dialectics. The conversations men engage in and the dialectics that Socrates practices are and are not separable. Socrates says he has always been a lover, a rastes, of a way than which none is more beautiful, but which often abandons him and leaves him perplexed. Socrates is a lover of philosophy. He does not and cannot philosophize at the drop of a hat, as if a philosophical question were already there, and all he had to do would be to face it and handle it. Only two dialogues begin without any preliminaries with what we may call a philosophical question. They start straight off with the question, what is? And in both cases, the interlocutor is anonymous. That the love of the good emerges as the theme of one, the Hipparchus, and law is the theme of the other, the Minos, seems not unrelated to their evidently philosophical character. Socrates says that law wants to be the discovery of what is. Philosophy, in any case, cannot be something that one does. There must be, then, a pre-philosophical state of the lover of philosophy from which he begins. This preliminary condition shows up in ordinary conversation, and only because of a turn within it does it begin to become dialectics. Socrates asks Cephalus in the Republic how he finds old age, and his putative concern with his own old age, as if he did not know that Athens would cut his life short, prompts this friendly but idle question. Cephalus speaks of several things, the weakness of old age, the change in desires time brings, money, the hopes and terrors of the afterlife, and justice. Socrates picks justice out of the medley of Cephalus's remarks, but can readily see that either death or desire, no less than the love of gain, could have occasioned another kind of discussion. Now, once justice becomes the question, it does not become philosophic before the question of what justice is gets disentangled from the question what good it is. This disengagement however, of interest from being is merely a surface transformation. What is still pushing the discussion is interest in justice, for without such an interest, any answer, no matter how defective, would be in the face of indifference as satisfactory as any other. Consequently, the occasion and the question cannot be separated even while they are being separated. What keeps them together is the philosopher's self-knowledge, which essentially depends on maintaining a double vision. What is it and what good is it? Eros is the name for this double vision. It is the bond between what is to be known and what it means to know it. It consists in the acknowledgment that the separation needed for understanding and the union desired for satisfaction cannot be naturally overcome. To have the erotic art is to have the capacity to get absorbed in the question at hand and never forget oneself. Plato's way of representing this to us is to raise the most difficult of questions while making Socrates the most vividly conceived of individuals. The anonymity of, anonymity of mind has the most distinctive of human faces. Socrates at one point identifies his daimonion, or as one might say, his fateful individuality with Eros. In one sense, the symposium contains the entire Socratic teaching on Eros, in just the way the Republic is the Socratic teaching on justice. But the Republic is supplemented by two other political dialogues, 
the statesman and the laws. The statesman analyzes the human condition if there are no gods and the wise man were to rule. The laws conceives of a city in which the philosopher does not rule, but laws rule in his stead. Laws can rule only if they are written and readily available to every citizen and formulated within his capacity. Otherwise, one would have to rely on the memory of the oldest members of the community. The Phaedrus inserts its supplementary teaching about Eros into the broader topic of persuasion. And persuasion, in turn, is considered in both its spoken and written forms. There is, then, an obvious connection between the laws and the Phaedrus. For the Athenian stranger wishes to put preludes that know how to persuade in front of laws that hitherto have only threatened. That these two dialogues alone occur outside the city strengthens their connection. They are concerned with the philosopher's return to the city. As Socrates says, despite his love of learning, the countryside and trees are unwilling to teach him. Cicero also acknowledged the kinship between the laws and the Phaedrus by borrowing his setting for his dialogue on laws from the Phaedrus. These formal connections, including the Athenian stranger's adaptation of Socrates' myth in the Phaedrus, get further confirmation if one considers that the Socratic teaching about Eros in the symposium cuts the good away from the beautiful to which Eros was conventionally attached, whereas the myth of the Phaedrus seemingly ignores the teaching of the symposium, puts the beautiful back in place as the core of Eros, and does not set the good among the so-called hyperuranian beings. We have then the proportion that the good is to the beautiful as the symposium is to the Phaedrus. Socrates' teaching about Eros, which he presented not as his, but Diotima's, became known many years after its disclosure at a private party and involved an oral transmission through two lovers of Socrates. And the one to whom we listen is quite out of his mind with virulent denunciations of others, self-contempt, and a senseless adoration of Socrates. The Socratic teaching thus leaks out to a wider public quite by accident. What, however, would be the case if there were a re more reliable means of transmission? The beautiful, I suggest, would become the public face of the good. In the second letter, Plato says there is no writing of his, nor will there ever be. But what is now said belongs to a Socrates become young and beautiful. The Phaedrus, then, is concerned with the perpetuation of Socrates by other means. And the laws, accordingly, concerns the perpetuation of the wise ruler by written law. The Phaedrus analyzes the relation between Socrates and Plato. The laws, the relation between the philosopher and the lawgiver. Now that the assertion that the symposium teaches that Eros is always of the good disregards the massive contradiction in that teaching between its initial argument for the primacy of the good and its final vision about the primacy of the beautiful. This contradiction dissolves as soon as one realizes that diatema has to account for the difficulty that if eros is the universal desire for the good, not everyone is called a lover. The account of the truth includes an account of error. Diotima's explanation is that the desire for self-perpetuation, whether it be in sexual generation, deeds of great renown, or poetic production, overlays the true duality of eros with its poetic version, 
so that the eternal desire for the good on the part of the individual becomes the desire for the eternal perpetuation of the individual. What is the good in the element of philosophy becomes the beautiful in the element of production. This occurs through the easy shift that Eros undergoes from being a predicate to being a subject. As a predicate, Eros is initially a stative verb. In Greek, in any case, this usage is the commonest one. Its expression is, he is in love, or she has fallen in love, and not, he loves so-and-so. The experience of Eros, however, is inseparable from its transitivity. To love is also a verb in the active voice, it therefore sets up automatically its object as the passive recipient of itself as agent. The lover constitutes the beloved and believes that just as if he were to punish, someone would be punished, so if he loves, someone is loved. Although Eros in itself has no power to effect a transformation of the object into its patient, the lover feels compelled to assign love to the beloved. Because the beloved is responsible for the eros of the lover, he is, the lover believes, eros. The cause is identified with its effect. The neediness of the lover is now the fullness of eros as embodied in the beloved. It is primarily for this reason that Plato splits his account between the symposium and the Phaedrus. The various speakers in the symposium express how they have experienced Eros. They therefore slide easily from the desire itself to what is desired, friendship or equality between lover and beloved. They thus praise Eros as if it were not essentially a defective mode, but they endow it instead with what they believe it can achieve, the perfection of the beloved. Eros is now both the cause of their lack and its cure. Aristophanes alone sees that Eros is self-conscious neediness, but because he disassociates it from mind and holds it to be aiming at a utopian self-completion without the intermediary of the beautiful or the good, it would in fact entail the total reconstruction of man. It is the ground of total despair. Agathon, on the other hand, absorbs Eros entirely into the beautiful so that it ceases to be defective and becomes indistinguishable from the devices of poetry. The two speeches Socrates makes in the Phaedrus mirror the single series of speeches reports of Diotima's in the symposium. Just as Diotima's speeches proceed from eros of the good to eros of the beautiful and beyond, so Socrates' first speech is about the good and the second about the beautiful. The first speech of Socrates is well laid out. It begins with a definition of eros and then goes on from the goods of the soul to those of the body and ends up with pleasure. It argues for the non-gratification of the lover by the beloved. Its perfectly sensible arguments are undercut by their speaker. Socrates presents him as a lover who has convinced his beloved that he is a non-lover. Now the non-lover by definition is the beloved. So the lover puts on the disguise of the beloved and supplies the reasons why the beloved should not be seduced. Socrates does not supply the second half of the speech, which was the original challenge, as to why the beloved, in rejecting the lover, should gratify the non-lover. This missing half is Socrates' second speech, in which he praises the lover, who is, of course, the speaker of the first speech. Socrates will later say, that the two speeches are one speech and correspond to the difference between the way of instruction and the way of dialectics. 
Plato's arguments are relatively easy, uh, relatively short and easy to follow. But the drift of each argument is far more slippery, and how to discern the dialectical in the conversational surpasses everything else in difficulty. In the Phaedrus, the relation between the first speech and its speaker encapsulates the difference between the particularity of circumstances and the universality of reason. Their superficial connection is the modifications that the circumstantial imposes on the universal and the necessary. But as this case shows, it is not possible to pull them apart and discount in some measured way the interests of the speaker from the speech. Accordingly, in order to attain to the true relation between the circumstantial and the necessary, it is necessary to discover in the circumstantial itself the universal. This discovery discloses the beautiful as the concrete universal. Socrates' second speech is much harder to grasp in its structure. The speech is in nine parts. The, I'll, I'll give you the parts in summary. The first part is the four kinds of madness. The second, the soul as self-motion. The third is the structure of soul. The fourth is the wing. The fifth is the hyperuranian beings. The sixth is nine types of mind. The seventh is the beautiful or eleven kinds of soul. The eight is white and black horses. And the ninth is Socrates' erotic art. So the speech is in these nine parts. The first part is about four kinds of divine madness, of which Eros is the highest. Socrates will go on to argue that Eros is the height of sophosune, or moderation and self-knowledge, and it is identical with his own erotic art. This astonishing claim brings us back to the Republic, where we also find an analysis of the structure of the soul. In that analysis, there is a conspicuous flaw where it is reasonable to suppose that wisdom is the natural perfection of reason and courage the natu natural perfection of the spirited element, thumos. Moderation cannot be understood as the natural perfection of desire. That misalignment can be said to be corrected in the Phaedrus, if in fact a certain kind of madness proves to be the highest kind of sanity. At the same time, the difference between the two presentations of soul underlines the difference between the politicized soul of the Republic and the erotic soul of the Phaedrus. Socrates admits in the Republic that its political dimension checks him from giving a precise account of soul. Now, in the Phaedrus, the second part of Socrates' speech concerns the soul as self-motion. The third part, the soul's structure. Whereas the soul as self-motion is couched in the form of an argument, the soundness of whose reasoning we may que one may question, the soul's structure is presented in an image which one may find more or less persuasive. The soul consists of a chariot, charioteer, and two horses, all of them winged. Regardless of whether it partakes of some divine portion by nature or not, it is certainly as monstrous and complex as Typhon, the last enemy of the Olympian gods. For Socrates to achieve self-knowledge is to know whether he has more in common with Typhon than the divine. In the course of his speech, Socrates gives an interpretation of all the parts of the soul's image except for one. He never interprets the chariot. One sees at once that the soul's structure entails that the soul have parts, and if it has parts, it cannot be said to move itself. Socrates might imply that if and only if an argument could replace the image, 
would the inconsistency between principle and structure disappear? This kind of inconsistency shows up throughout Plato. In the Republic, the principle of the city's justice is one man, one job. No one is to practice more than the one art each knows perfectly. The class of warriors, however, who start out like everyone else with a single art, the art of war, end up as the bond of the city, uniting the rulers who know the art of rule and the artisans who severally know one art perfectly, through embodying the lawful opinions of the city, but of which opinions they have no knowledge. This necessary dilution of the principle for the sake of the structure has its counterpart in the Phaedrus and makes one wonder why Socrates needed the principle of self-motion at all if, in fact, he devotes the rest of his speech exclusively to the soul's structure. The fourth part of the speech concerns the wing. The wing is that which lifts the soul outside the visible universe to the region beyond heaven with the direct vision of beings to which no admixture of becoming adheres, nourishes the charioteer or mind. Socrates mentions at first justice, moderation, and science. The gods easily go beyond heaven. Other souls have more or less a difficult time of it. Either the badness of the horses or the incompetence of the charioteer hinders their ascent, but no one can become a human being unless he has caught a glimpse, at least, of the beings. The human soul, then, is constituted primarily by mind, or the capacity to understand whatever is said by species in proceeding from many perceptions and gathering them by calculation, logismos, into one. Man is the rational animal, the animal that speaks and generalizes. The degree to which a soul has seen the beings determines the intellectual type he becomes once he loses his wings as he struggles forward in the disorderly squadrons of the gods. There are nine of these types. So far, the horses have no function except to thwart the possibility of complete wisdom for any soul. Now comes the wrinkle. The wings of the soul do not convey the soul straight up. Instead, the horizontal motion of the horses interferes with such an ascent. A resolution of the two motions leads to a skewed ascent. This skewed ascent attaches the souls to the train of 11 Olympian gods who do not care for the army that follows them but do not interfere with their following. Two things, then, constitute the human being, mind and soul. In most cases, there is a lack of coincidence between one's Olympian soul and one's intellectual capacity or talent. What one is good at is usually not the same as one's own complete good. This disparity can be so great that one chooses after the first incorporation to be a beast in any cycle afterwards. The desire for completeness overwhelms the necessary incompleteness of mind. One's Olympian soul makes one in principle a whole. One's partial vision of the beings from which one's own soul makes one diverge can never be completed. As the wholeness of soul stands opposed to the limitless divisibility of art, so the way to understanding is the obstacle to understanding. Socrates bridges the gap between soul and mind through the beautiful. The beautiful has the unique privilege of showing itself in likenesses to itself. No other being, neither justice, moderation, nor any other virtue of soul, 
discloses itself as vividly as the beautiful in its images. The visibly beautiful triggers a reminder of the truly beautiful. The shape that the visibly beautiful takes is that of a god. The beloved appears as an Olympian god in conformity with the nature of the soul of the lover. Each lover fashions the beloved into a statue of his own soul and worships it as if it were a god. He completes his own soul in the beloved. This completion occurs for the following reason. The expression love at first sight indicates how the lover becomes a lover. But in order to get the beloved to share this experience, he must translate his vision into a speech. The lover must go beyond his initial experience and universalize it. He can remain true to his vision only if he stays tongue-tied. But as soon as he tries to convey what he feels, he alters his feeling for the sake of gathering the beloved into his experience. Poetry and song are the usual vehicles of this transformation. One can express it by way of two puns. The verb to love, eran, looks like the verb to see, horan. And the accusative of eros, erota, is identical in form and almost in sound to the imperative of the verb to ask questions, erota. The mind, as the capacity to collect a manifold of perceptions into one, serves to conceive of the species that will be intelligible and persuasive to the beloved. Now the speech of the lover looks to the beloved as an enhanced version of himself, but it is in fact an enhanced version of the lover, which the beloved is summoned to behold. If the lover succeeds in inducing in the beloved through speech what he himself did not undergo in speech, the beloved falls in love. Socrates says, he is in love, but he is at a loss with what? And he neither knows what he has experienced nor can he point it out. But just as if he were to receive a disease of the eyes from another, he cannot speak of its ground but just as in a mirror he sees himself in the lover without being aware of it. The eros of the beloved is the experience of self-motion and the condition for self-motion is self-ignorance. One moves towards oneself in the guise of another that is simultaneously the other in the guise of oneself. What then of the horses? How do they fit into this account? One of these horses is white, perfectly proportioned, and obedient to the control of the charioteer. The other is black, misshapen, and obstreperous. It has the snub nose of Socrates. The black horse is, so is nothing but Socrates' eros. The white horse is the product of Socrates' erotic art and represents the pairing of the beloved with the lover. The wing of the lover extends over the beloved and, and as a result, their eros becomes jointly winged, homopteros. The white horse is the beautiful projection of the black horse onto another and corresponds to Socrates' first speech, which with its perfectly ordered form comes out of Socrates the lover who has disguised himself as the non-lover or the beloved. It is in this case the beautiful Phaedrus with whom Phaedrus the beloved can fall in love and be induced to return to philosophy. Socrates' two speeches are thus really a single speech in which the second speech has absorbed the first speech into itself and shown it for what it is. Socrates has thus given a general account of his erotic art. It consists in the uncanny capacity to figure out the nature of the soul of his interlocutor 
and to contrive in accordance with it that form that completes it as it turns the soul to the desire to understand what is truly intelligible. The myth of the Phaedrus is Socrates' account of himself and his action. It does not apply to anyone else. It is the showing forth of the circumstantial action in its philosophical logos. It shows that the ugliness of Socrates and the beauty of his speeches necessarily belong together. Alcibiades thought they could be pulled apart, for he failed to understand the connection between the lowly arts that Socrates discussed and the lofty visions he devised. Phaedrus had initiated the topic of the symposium, the praise of the god Eros, by asking why no poet or prose writer had ever adequately praised him. As always a beloved and never a lover, he was puzzled as to what was in it for the lover, or what made the lover so enthusiastic about a form of slavery that if there were not gods could benefit only the beloved. Socrates answers the second question in the symposium. The benefit accrues solely to the lover. And he answers the first question in the Phaedrus. The god Eros is nothing but the manifold of human erotic natures insofar as they are severally idealized by the lover and foisted onto the beloved. But Socrates himself, with his protean nature, does not fit into any single type. He has no white horse. Rather, always needy and always perplexed, without any trace in him of the goddess Hestia, who never leaves home. He is immune from illusions, hopes, and ideals, and is Eros itself united with mind. In his analysis of his double speech, to which he ascribes a bilateral symmetry, Socrates assigns the left side to himself, and somewhat awkwardly, he leaves it syntactically bereft, without the particle it needs to contrast it with the right side. Socrates is always the other of the other. He has usurped the role of the poets and become the fabricator of human wholes through which he can lead his young friends to philosophy. In this sense, one charge against Socrates, as he himself reports it, would be true. He is a maker of gods. Plato merely continues Socrates' erotic art in written form. The dialogues are meant to replace the Olympian gods, to whom, as Herodotus says, Homer and Hesiod distributed their several honors, arts, and shapes. But the dialogues are of a far greater number, variety, and enchantment. They are so many white horses, each one of which leads astray as it leads upwards. <laughs>